All right, let's talk about Shanks in this one and the possibility, keyword, possibility that he was actually evil the whole time. Yeah, I know that's probably anger inducing because he's very beloved, but he's also a pretty sussy baka at the same time, right? But also I'm gonna be going into major spoilers for the manga, so, you know, don't watch the video if you're an anime only or whatever. But let's get into it. Go into a deep dive of Shanks and try to figure out if he's actually evil this whole time and he's been manipulating Luffy. So if we go back to the very first chapter of One Piece, it says a small harbor village, which is Fusha Village. One year ago, a pirate ship made the village its base. And this pirate ship, of course, belongs to Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates. And we all know what happens after this. He builds a bond with Luffy. Then Luffy accidentally eats the rubber fruit or should I say the human fruit model Nika? But let's backtrack a little. So why did Shanks come to Fusha Village for a year? We could just say, hey, it's a coincidence. He just happened to be there. He found it nice. And uh, you know, him meeting Luffy is just by chance or it's because the fruit that he had wanted him to meet Luffy because you know, the Gorosei say that the Zoan fruits have a mind of their own and that it almost intentionally escaped them. There's another possibility because Shanks may have purposely been here not looking for Luffy but more so looking for Ace because Mount Kalubo is right behind Fusha Village where Luffy, Ace, and Dadan were staying. Now why would we be looking for Ace? Well because Ace is Roger's son of course and we all know that Shanks was brought up by Roger. Now also we're led to believe that Shanks didn't know that Ace was Roger's son at this point especially because when we see Ace meet Shanks in chapter 552 Shanks kind of acts like oblivious to Ace and he's like, oh, you're uh, Luffy's brother? Oh, that's cool. I never knew. Tell me how he's doing. But I'd like to think that Shanks probably knew that Ace was Roger's son because as we'll go forward, it seems that Shanks knows a lot more than what he's letting on, which goes into why he even has the human fruit model Nika in the first place. Because in the first chapter, after it's discovered that Luffy ate the fruit, Lucky Roo says, it's not here, the gum gum fruit we took from that enemy ship. And we won't find out for like over a thousand chapters later that they actually stole it from a world government ship because in chapter 1014 when who's who is explaining all of this to Jinbei he says I went through hell all because of a single mistake 12 years ago a devil fruit was stolen from a government ship and when straw had appeared two years ago I was shocked to learn the truth that straw had had eaten the very gum gum fruit that was stolen from that ship so once again is this just a coincidence that Shanks happened to steal this fruit from that ship, just like it was a coincidence that he was at Fusha Village? Probably not. Especially when we started to find out the true significance of the fruit in 1037 when the Gorosei said, that fruit is only a legend now, even to us. It has not awakened for centuries upon centuries. Then why would the world government bother to give that one specific devil fruit another name? And then going forward to chapter 1044, they say, the other name of the gum gum fruit is the Zoan type human human fruit, mythical type model Nika. And considering this lines up with Who's Who's exposition on Sun God Nika, the freer of the slaves. And if we match up the silhouettes, it's pretty obvious that this was the fruit that Joy Boy originally had. Since after Luffy awakens the fruit, Zunisha says Joy Boy has returned. And considering that Joy Boy is pretty much the Antichrist to Emu and the world government, it makes sense that they wanted to spread this information about his fruit so that no one else would get it, awaken it, and become the new Joy Boy such as Luffy has. So, that being said, it's likely that Shanks knows this. Now, how does Shanks know this? Not really sure, because we know that he didn't go to Laugh Tale with Roger's crew. He stayed back after finding out that Buggy had become sick. And that leaves us with the question of how would Shanks know this? Well, we just don't know yet. But like I said, it just can't be coincidence. But anyway, let's go back to Shanks looking for Ace in Fusha Village. Shanks has the fruit. He shows up there. Now, why is he looking for Ace? Now, other than him just being Roger's son, Roger said to Rayleigh, when asked, who do you think would find the One Piece? Roger said, my son, obviously. So I guess Shanks knew this too. He figured, well, I'll have Roger's legacy live on. I somehow know the components needed to find the One Piece, and it starts with getting this model Nika fruit. So instead of me eating it, I'll give it to Roger's son, Ace, and then he will be the one to find One Piece. And I guess this is where we could go into Shanks possibly being evil. 
Possibly. Because I'm not entirely sure myself, because Shanks does a lot of altruistic things, and a lot of selfless things. I mean, especially giving up his arm to save Luffy. Then again, there's like some information out there saying that Oda didn't originally want that to happen, and that his editors kind of pressured him into having Shanks lose an arm to raise the stakes for the readers. But anyway, let's go back to Luffy eating the fruit. So this kind of stifles Shanks' original plan of wanting to give it to Ace. So if Shanks is evil, I assume that he would just want Ace to find the One Piece for him, and therefore for the world government possibly, which is also why he's allowing Luffy to do what he does, because I guess that's why he saved Luffy in the first place, because he ate the model Nika fruit, and he was kind of like, ah, well I need to keep this guy alive. You also might be wondering like, well then why didn't he just kill Luffy and have the fruit reincarnate? And that's a great question. So it's either because he actually likes Luffy and he wanted him to live, or he's not that evil to where he's just gonna murder a child. Or, you know, it just kind of ruins the whole plot of the story if he just immediately does that. But also, you know, maybe Shanks or Oda himself didn't fully flesh out the idea of Devil Fruit Reincarnation at that point. I mean, we didn't find out it was a thing until much later on. But then Luffy gets the fruit, and then also I'm assuming this is why Shanks gives him the straw hat, because he knows that he has the Nika fruit, therefore he's pretty much destined to find the One Piece. And the straw hat has something to do with the One Piece and the Ds and all that stuff. We don't understand what the Straw Hat significance is yet. We do know that there's two of them. One that's giant, currently in Marujois, probably belonged to the original Joy Boy, who is implied to be a giant at this point. And then there's the smaller one. I'm assuming it's from like the two main D lineages, possibly, but that's a story for another time. But interestingly enough, Shanks says for Luffy to return the hat to him once he becomes a great pirate. So that's a little confusing, right? Why would Shanks want the hat? Back. But anyway, if Shanks is using Luffy here to find the One Piece, so I don't know, he could benefit the dragons or Emu or whatever, well, it's because Shanks is a celestial dragon. Now this goes more into the realm of pretty much the truth at this point while it hasn't been revealed yet. I'm way more positive of this being the case rather than him just being evil or whatever. So in chapter 957 we find out about the God Valley incident where Sengoku says 38 years ago at God Valley the rocks pirates the strongest crew in the world were wiped out at an island called God Valley according to the news report. In order to protect celestial dragons and their slaves at God Valley, Garp joined forces with Roger there at the island and they broke apart the rocks pirates. That is the God Valley incident. So 38 years ago, Shanks is currently 39. Roger was there. We know that celestial dragons were involved. I'm pretty sure that that's where Roger found baby Shanks and then he raised him to be you know, pirate or whatever. Also, in chapter 966, when Roger is holding baby Momonosuke, he says, I haven't spent time with a baby in ages. And Rayleigh says, reminds me of the old days. So Oda usually doesn't have like random throwaway dialogue like this. Almost everything means something, and this could be reference to him talking about raising baby Shanks. And yes, I know, in Viver card number 0017, it says Shanks was born in the West Blue, but I don't really care. And that brings us to why Shanks could be double-crossing Luffy or manipulating Luffy. So if we go to chapter 903, once Luffy's new bounty is revealed after coming out of Whole Cake Island, we see Shanks reading the paper, and he says, looks like we'll be meeting soon soon, Luffy. Now going just briefly forward to chapter 906, we see Emu holding Luffy's bounty paper and looking at what is implied to be Joy Boy's original straw hat. And then the following chapter, 907, we see Shanks meeting with the Gorose. And they say, what do you want? Why would you come all this way? This is the reverie. Given your standing, you should have nothing to do with politics. We only arranged this time on your request. So... Why would they let Shanks in there? I mean, of all the places, to meet face to face with them. Because like I said, he's a celestial dragon and they know it. And then going further, they're like, then let's hear what you have to say. Guards, leave us. So like letting the guards leave, they fully trust Shanks here. It doesn't make sense other than him being a celestial dragon. You know what I mean? But then Shanks says, there's a pirate I need to talk to you about. 
Now remember, chapter 903 was only four chapters ago when he discovered what Luffy's new bounty was. Is he talking about Luffy here? I mean, when I first read this chapter, I thought, well, I guess he's talking about Blackbeard, right? Because there's always been the Blackbeard versus Shanks dynamic. And that's another reason why I'm pretty sure Shanks is a Celestial Dragon, because in chapter 966, when we see Blackbeard and Shanks first meet, they automatically didn't like each other. I'm pretty sure it's because Blackbeard is a D, and Shanks is a celestial dragon, and the Ds and the dragons are always at battle with each other. And they just kind of subconsciously already knew that they were at odds. Now, does Blackbeard currently know that Shanks is a celestial dragon and that's why he tried to kill him? I don't know. I mean, why wouldn't Blackbeard just tell everyone that Shanks is a celestial dragon? Although, I really wouldn't be surprised if Blackbeard does know, but he's kind of just keeping it to himself in case he needs to use that information strategically later on or something. But if he's not talking about Blackbeard, Blackbeard, which Occam's Razor at this point indicates that he would be, then he's talking about Luffy because he realizes that, oh man, Luffy has gotten to a 1.5 billion bounty. He's probably close to awakening his fruit, which, you know, for the sake of the argument in this video, he knows is the human fruit model Nika. But anyway, we were on chapter 907. Let's go to 908 because this is where Emu cuts up pictures of Shirahoshi, Blackbeard, and Luffy. So that splits it into three options there. Was it Blackbeard, Luffy, or Shirahoshi? I mean, obviously Emu wants all of them dead. And that brings us to the ending of that chapter where the Goro say bow down to her saying have you decided upon another light to be erased from history simply state the name you wish stricken and that kind of just stops there until chapter 1041 when the gorosei finally acknowledge luffy and contact the cp0 agents at wano when they're like listen closely the five elders have issued an edict eliminate straw hat luffy at once so is this finally all coming full circle because of what shanks told them or did it tell them in 907 but then that kind of conflicts with the whole point of him using Luffy to find One Piece or to make the One Piece happen because of the fruit that he has possibly not really sure because like I said we're just looking at the possibility of him being evil I personally don't really know but I think it would be an incredible twist if Shanks was actually evil this whole time. I mean, technically he is kind of evil by proxy because he associates with the Gorosei. The Gorosei are as evil as it gets. I don't want to drop any, you know, words in this video, but they have direct parallels to a certain group in real life that is like regarded as evil. Or maybe Shanks is being misled. Maybe he thinks he's doing the right thing, but he's actually doing the wrong thing. You know what I mean? Not really sure. <laughs> First Wolf asks, with the reveal of Luffy's essentially god devil fruit, do you think that there are other fruits similar to it? I have seen a lot of reverencing to the rain, forest, and earth gods mentioned earlier on in the series. So I'm glad you brought this up First Wolf because a lot of people have been talking to me about this over the last couple weeks, especially with the reveal of sun god Nika and the mythical fruit pertaining to him. Because it seems like a lot of this was foreshadowed slash set up with the flashback that we got with Nolan, you know, during Skypiea with the Shandians and 400 years ago all that stuff and it turns out that yeah i guess it was because the main chapter that we want to take a look at is 287 because in that chapter we see like the high priest freaking out and he's basically saying that if they want to save the shandians they're going to have to pay tribute to the gods through the great kashigami which is like the big blue nola snake that we saw in skypea but this is like his grandfather and they'll have to offer him the blood of the most beautiful maiden in the village and later on we see this beautiful maiden who has been chosen as the sacrifice and her mom's like crying and she says why are you crying, mama? I'm going to meet the sun god. So that right there is like the big thing that everybody's talking about. Like, oh my god, that was sun god Nika the whole time. And I guess it kind of is. But the really big intriguing moment comes a little later on in the chapter. Because when we see the beautiful maiden being brought to the sacrificial offer, they say god of the sun, god of the rain, god of the forest, god of the earth. So naturally, that makes us think, oh... Is there more than just Sun God Nika? Are there actually four mythical gods? And if so, do they have a mythical fruit attached to them? Now, before we go into what or who they could be, another thing that's been brought to my attention is the mermaid quintuplets that we see in chapter 608, you know, in the whole Fishman Island arc, because their names are Ichika, Nika, Sanka, Yanka, and Yanka too. And it's possible that this could be Oda's little wink as to like who the gods or the mythical gods 
gods are or were. I mean, aside from their names just being one, two, three, four, we obviously see that the second one is called Mika. And the color scheme here is pretty interesting too, because the one named Mika is red and white and normally you know with battle manga series we could just say oh maybe it's just a fun little coincidence but with one piece and oda usually things are done for a very specific reason like it's insane how in detail he goes with things and i don't think that this is just a coincidence i'm pretty sure he probably did this on purpose but anyway the color scheme that we see with her is red and white red could mean the sun of course and the white could be the latex or the resin you know the true nature of rubber and also why luffy has the white aesthetic once he awakens his fruit and becomes sun god mika now as for the other colors we see ichika has green and white sanka has blue yanka and yanka too have white and like jaguar pattern leopard pattern whatever so that could correlate to the other gods which means that sanka could be the rain god since it's blue ichika could be the forest god because it's green and then as for the earth god maybe that could be like a duo or something because for the joke with yanka and yanka too i mean even in this panel it says shouldn't your name be goka you know for five now i don't know why earth would represent white especially since we already have that with nika but the jaguar leopard pattern thing makes more sense for that i suppose but also if we go back to chapter 287 on the sacrificial altar one of the individuals tying the maiden down has like a jaguar leopard costume on and the other guy has like a bird costume on so this could be in homage to the gods that they're reverencing maybe again oda doesn't do this stuff coincidentally everything is for a reason so i wouldn't be surprised if the leopard slash jaguar patterns are connected between this and what we see with the mermaid quintuplets now also it doesn't necessarily mean that these are like literal devil fruits that exist maybe they just are the myths or the gods that they believed in possibly be. but i do think it would be pretty interesting if these did represent the other mythical fruits out there or if these were just like four big individuals that existed back in the day possibly like obviously joy boy 800 years ago was very much implied to have had the human human model nika fruit so maybe there was like three others with him and they also had mythical human fruits except they were the rain forest and earth gods and they had their own individual insane powers maybe and i'm sure some people speculate that dragon luffy's father has one of these fruits and i guess it's possible it would make most sense that maybe he had the rain god fruit but i think dragon's fruit is what we've been thinking about since the beginning and he probably has like either a air slash wind logia or like some kind of storm fruit but then again, we do get some insane reveals with these fruits, and he very likely could have some kind of mythical fruit that gives him storm abilities. Why not? But yeah, I just wanted to lay that out for you guys, and uh, let me know what you think about all this stuff in the comments. Kingsley asks, Lately I've been seeing people saying that Blackbeard's devil fruit is actually a mythical zoan as well. What do you think about this? So that's understandable, especially given that it was recently revealed that Luffy's fruit was actually secretly a mythical zoan this whole time. So why not his counterpart you know his biggest rival in blackbeard also having that twist to him as well and i guess the evidence that sparks this if any goes back to chapter 440 when blackbeard encounters ace when he's explaining the yami yami no me to him he says well it was just a twist of fate this ability chose me ace and going further he says this is something completely different from the rest of the logia so that's pretty interesting especially considering what the gorosei said about zoans in chapter 10 44, about how it like almost intentionally escaped them throughout the years and that zoan fruits have a mind of their own and that how it's pretty much implied that luffy ate the human fruit model nika because it wanted him to because you know he's like the new joy boy who inherited the will of d and he's supposed to bring the dawn and all that good stuff especially since it's heavily implied that the human fruit model nika was the same fruit that the first joy boy had so with blackbeard saying this to ace does it mean that the yami yami no mi is actually a mythical zoan or just a zoan this whole time as well well i mean maybe there's always the possibility of course and the gorosei has only really renamed the human fruit model nika to the rubber fruit 
we haven't heard of them renaming any other fruits but then again that whole little bit of information was only revealed in itself a couple months ago so i guess it's possible that they did rename other fruits maybe and that the yami yami no mi is one of them but as far as we know that's not the case so there's no reason for it to actually be like a mythical zone this whole time and not what it's said to be in the darkness loki but again keep in mind it's very possible only like 12 people knew that this was actually the human fruit model nika this whole time anyway leading up to this i was more so on the train of it being the resin fruit which it's still technically kind of is or it will be revealed that it is like resin based or just the natural property of rubber like resin coming from trees and the person who made me believe that was the one above all one piece youtuber uteron and going into more of what he has speculated about especially towards blackbeard is that he doesn't necessarily have like a mythical zoan fruit but he is like a hydra fish man or half hydra fish man or something like that which explains why marco said his body is odd and that maybe that explains how he's able to have multiple devil fruits also goes back to when Luffy and Zoro were first talking about Blackbeard on Jaya when referring to him specifically Zoro said it's them most likely but as for like the big secret about Blackbeard I don't think it's that he necessarily ate like a mythical Zoan even before the Yami Yami no Mi came into the picture I know some people speculate that he ate like the Cerebus fruit like the three-headed demon dog thing so that's why he's able to have multiple fruits and he'll probably have three and that's also why his flag has three skulls speaking of the flag it has three skulls but eight bones which also makes people think that he ate like the Kraken mythical Zoan or something and again this is all possible but but, but if we go back to like Blackbeard being a child, it seems that the oddity within him had already even started at that point. Especially when Buggy and Shanks first meet him, they say like, I heard he never sleeps. And of course that lines up with what Sanji and Luffy were talking about on Drum Island, where it's heavily implied that Blackbeard comes from, or at least partly. So that would mean that Blackbeard would have had to eat the devil fruit when he was like a kid which I mean, it's possible i mean luffy did but it just seems more so like this is like an inherent quality of blackbeard so what could it be well i'm more inclined to believe what uteron said about him possibly being like a part hydra fish man and when i say hydra i don't mean like the you know mythical serpent hydra i mean like the real aquatic animal i guess you would call it the hydra because it has like an ability to bud and regenerate and this could possibly be the explanation as to how blackbeard can have multiple multiple fruits and why he never sleeps because like one aspect of him is like internally sleeping or something while the other stays conscious also there's this age-old theory on why his teeth look different in certain chapters that could also be explained by the regeneration aspect of the hydra but then again i'm not really too sure about that this seems like this could be one of the rare mistakes that oda has made with the paneling but then again oda doesn't usually make mistakes like this and most of the time he does stuff like this intentionally and it also goes back to the three skulls maybe this is like the three i don't know inherent people that blackbeard is maybe he's like three conjoined siblings at once or it goes back to the budding aspect of the hydras like constantly producing others which could also mean that he has three hearts and that's another big aspect of one piece like multiple hearts especially with like the devil fruits and inherent personalities or spirits or whatever which i do think will lead to blackbeard having a third devil fruit by the time you know the big laugh tell arc comes and i assume it'll be a zoan at that point if he doesn't already have one so maybe he gets kaido's fruit somehow maybe that's one of the twists at the end of Wano. But Uteron speculates that if he is like part Hydra fishman or whatever, then in theory he would be able to have unlimited devil fruits. And that would really raise the bar towards the end of the series for, you know, Luffy's ultimate adversary if he doesn't wind up fighting Emu last. But yeah, just uh, so much speculation with Blackbeard at this point. Uh, I personally have no idea, but I don't think that the Yami Yami no Mi is secretly a mythical Zoan fruit the way that the rubber fruit was. Jimmy P asks, how big do you think Laugh Tale Island will be? And do you think it's inhabited or is it just some ruins? Basically, I'm trying to figure out what's so funny about an 800 year history of the evil controlling world government. So that's a great question. And everybody has their own little theory as to what Laugh Tale is and what the One Piece treasure is itself. So the main theory that I subscribe to is Uteron. 
Sports. I'm sure you guys have heard me mention this guy many times. I consider him the one above all One Piece YouTubers. And I think he may have been the one who discovered like what Laftel is and where it could be located. Now, as for what the One Piece treasure is or what's like located on Laftel, I'm not sure who came up with the theory that I'm going to be discussing, but I know it's been out there for a while. But anyway, as for Laftel itself, it's the missing island from Jaya. Because when we see Nami put the map of Jaya together, it winds up looking like a skull. And in the right eye, we see where Shandora is or was 400 years ago. But then next to it on the left, there's an island missing or perceived to be missing. And also just this right here kind of makes sense because they said 400 years ago, if it was taken, it would have been taken 800 years ago. 800 years is like the key number that we always get, you know, dating back to when the Boyd century began. So the theory is that the world government themselves or Emu controlling them took this island and put it under Eni's lobby because like that big hole where Eni's lobby is, you know, the big waterfall, it's down there. Now what I'm gonna go into at this point is my own little personal theory because I haven't really seen anybody say this. I just started thinking of it myself because like why did they have to take the island and put it somewhere? You know, like why wouldn't they just destroy it? And I'm thinking like, oh, maybe because they couldn't destroy it because maybe the entire island is either co or comprised of like pone glyph material because we know that the pone glyphs can't be destroyed. Now, what are pone glyphs made of? Uh, we don't know yet. I'm assuming they're made of something that comes from space or something because space is going to be a big element of the story going further. You know, we just discovered the Lunarian race. Pretty sure Lunarian is hinting at this race of people that we see King is coming from the moon, very likely. Also, it's very likely that Emu herself comes from the moon or one of the moons or just one of the neighboring planets around Earth. I'm going to make another individual video about that next week, but that could be where like the Pone Glyph stuff comes from, maybe. But I mean, that could be what Laugh Tale is comprised of, regardless of what it's made of or where it comes from. They just can't destroy it, so they had to put it under Annie's lobby. But what's there? Uh, I don't think anybody is like living there because they, you know, probably would have been killed. Because in chapter 967, Roger says we're the first people to discover Laugh Tale in 800 years. Now, going back to chapter 967, this is like one of the most important chapters because that's the chapter where Roger discovers Laugh Tale and we get the whole he laughs and why he named it Laugh Tell. But Odin says as he's logging in his journal, we learn the entire truth of the world, what the 100 year void is, what the people of the D are, what the H weapons are. And in the face of the vast treasure, which was very real indeed, Roger just laughed. So we know for sure that this information is there. So you get all of that stuff. And then since there's a vast treasure, there could be like a lot of gold, I'm guessing, because you know, that's what the Shandorans all had, like the city of gold and all that stuff and there's probably other trinkets and just you know traditional treasure there but what is like the main treasure like what is the one piece itself well one of like the most popular theories and the one that i think is probably true is that it's just sake you know like the uh, alcoholic beverage and that's probably why roger laughed because when he went there he discovered that joy boy the original one had left just sake for them to drink or whatever i guess when they finished the deed or something i don't think roger and his boys drank the sake because that would kind of ruin it i think it was meant for like joy boy or just the individuals who brought the dawn which obviously the roger pirates couldn't do because they came too soon now why is it sake well apparently the binks sake song tells us this i'm sure there's a lot of videos breaking down binks sake and why it tells you of where laugh tell is or just what is on on Laugh Tale, but the hook of the song is going to deliver Bink's sake. And then the very end of the song says, never ending, ever wandering, our funny traveling tale. Now that doesn't mean that it's directly referencing Laugh Tale because this song obviously existed before Roger named Laugh Tale, Laugh Tale, but it just means that it could just be funny and that anyone who discovered Laugh Tale 
would have thought it was a funny tale. So going back to chapter 967 again, they're constantly singing this song throughout the chapter, you know, going to laugh tell. And this song is always present in the series. And knowing Oda, I'm pretty sure he put this there for a reason because it is telling us what's going on. And I wouldn't be surprised if Joy Boy came up with this song or one of his boys of Joy did. So yeah, I mean, that's probably what it is. And if that is ultimately the reveal, you can already imagine what the reception on social media is going to be like. So let's talk about what I think Blackbeard is ultimately going to wind up doing with Law because we saw yeah. in the previous chapter that they kind of had like round one of their fight, I guess you can say, where, you know, the Heart Pirates surprisingly did really good. Like none of us were expecting that. We saw Law hit Blackbeard with the cave room and then hit him with the shock will. Awesome sequence, just like what he did to Big Mom. Yeah. And then Blackbeard kind of like recuperated, had a little talk with Van Auger. He then activated the Black Vortex, which is like his- uh, yami His Krozu. Yeah, like his nullifying ability. So he's basically going to shut down Law's Devil Fruit at this point, just like what we saw him do to Ace and Whitebeard previously. Yeah. And this is probably where you know, he's going to take round two and probably the rest of the fight at this point. Do you think that that's probably... Oh, 1000%. Okay. Did you see... Like, Law looked shocked at the very end of that fight. Like, yeah. when his awakened devil fruit didn't go through and pierce him and blackbeard just caught it you could tell law was panicked and a weird thing about blackbeard's kurozu or however he absorbs devil fruits is that it also negates the impact that was about to hit him as well because when he blocked whitebeard's go to go to no me whitebeard still had a fist behind that but the fist stopped blackbeard was able to catch it so even if there's a sword behind law's awakening i feel like it's just going to get absorbed or it's just going to have no impact whatsoever so yeah, it's just it's just hard to fight blackbeard but once he in theory, defeats Law here. He's definitely going to take his devil fruit, the Opie Opie no me. No reason not to. I mean, even though he hasn't advertised it the way that he said that he was going to take uh, Hancock's fruit, yeah. I'm pretty sure he's going to take it. And, you know, there's speculation on how he does it. It hasn't been revealed for a reason. It, it eventually will be. Maybe in this sequence, probably not. Even though we are like so far into the series, it still feels like it's, Oda's not ready. I, I feel like they might reveal like a small bit of it because the other crew, the Straw Hat crew are on Egghead Island. And that's supposedly where we're gonna learn about Devil Fruits. Maybe they'll do it in tandem where Vegapunk reveals how Devil Fruits are made, uh, what they're all about and how they're transferred. And at the same time, we see Blackbeard performing whatever he does at the same time. So it would go like hand in hand in a way. Yeah. That's what I would hope. Oda does do that. So yeah, yeah that, that would totally work. But once he takes Law's Devil Fruit, I don't think he's going to eat it or consume it himself. Although I do yeah. think that Blackbeard will consume another fruit if he hasn't already. Like he's definitely going to have at least three fruits. Like it would be yeah. weird to the just- The number three is like yeah. everywhere with him. Yeah, yeah, the three skulls and- you know, that's a whole rabbit hole for another time, but yeah, he's going to give it to somebody else because I'm assuming that Blackbeard knows about the perpetual use surgery. It's, I feel like it's almost advertised to a point. Like the government was after this fruit. It had a bounty of 5 billion. I feel like it should be common knowledge that lost fruit is heavily sought after. Even if not for the immortality surgery, it's just a good fruit in general. And oh, no, with it's, Blackbeard- it's busted, yeah. yeah. It's busted. With Blackbeard being on Whitebeard's ship before all of this, Blackbeard should have the same information in a way as Whitebeard did. And there's no way Yonko didn't know that the Opo Yopo no Mi is widely sought after. Yeah, exactly. And we found this out from uh, Da Flamingo, and he knows yeah. a lot of stuff. But we just assume he knows a lot of stuff because like he's a celestial dragon, he's Joker, he, he you know he has yeah. a lot of connections. But I mean, he even knows stuff that the audience doesn't even know, like the treasure of Marichua. But I think that Blackbeard probably knows it because he knows a lot of things. Like he he I mean he clearly knows about putting her third eye being able to uh, unlock the voice of all things. Uh, that's why he captured her. I'm sure we're gonna talk about that in your video. Oh yeah. He's going to have somebody else consume the fruit. Now, I don't necessarily think that he's going to have somebody on his crew do it because you have to give your life in order to use yeah. that ability. He might have somebody from Law's crew like forcibly do it, or I don't know, just some random person is going to have it. And then he somehow is going to force them to activate the perpetual use surgery on himself. And then once that happens, I'm pretty sure he's going to get like the eyes, like the Mihawk 
Oh, eyes. yeah. And There's a lot of theories about that. Exactly. And I think that, like, once he gets that, that will be, like, the confirmation that, like, all those other characters also have had the perpetual use surgery performed on them. So it's, like, Emu, Mihawk, Zunisha, and Hakuba for some reason. Yeah. And I think that would just be an amazing way for that to get across. It would be a, it would be a really good reveal. And going back to, like, who would do the youth surgery... I would love it if Law was the one who actually performed it as well. Oh, and perfect. and it, I know it, it's it's hard to like picture Law being like, okay, Blackbeard, time to give you you know immortality. <laughs> but Law is a captain first and foremost. And if Law witnesses his entire crew being destroyed, they're about to die, and Blackbeard is like, okay, well you have to choose. Like you either die with them or I'll let them go, and you just have to perform the surgery. Like I feel like Law might bend the knee because wow. in a way law is like a parallel to luffy right like law loves his crew even in wano he mentioned how he didn't believe that beppo or the others would ever rat out on the plan which ended up being true he trusted his crew and like beppo as much as a lot of people make fun of beppo and john bart that's his sanji and zoro so like if, if luffy was in the same scenario i could see luffy sacrificing himself and if blackbeard holds them hostage like blackbeard probably would since he's a bad guy i could see law maybe doing it himself and also whoever does the surgery needs medical knowledge and there's not a lot of people out there in the world that could do that even yeah i was also wondering about that like how do they know how to activate yeah. that aspect of like, it but you well, what, do you, what do you stab up, yeah yeah what do you stab like what do you do you think about it but now that you bring <laughs> up law giving his own life like I wasn't even thinking about that because I just assumed that he would take Law's fruit and then Law would just go into the rest of the series fruitless rather than just yeah. being dead. But wow, him dying and sacrificing himself for this crew, now that you bring it up, seems very possible. And also, you know, what you mentioned about him being loyal and him totally being capable of that, it would kind of parallel to Corazon saving him. Yeah. Because Corazon obviously gave his own life so that Law could live. And then maybe he would think about that and be like, you know, Corazon did it for me, so I'm going to do it for them. And he Black gives back. Exactly. Blackbeard is also very capable of just being like, hey, I'm going to kill your whole crew if you don't do this. And it's like he's in this inescapable, impossible situation and he just does it. Man, that, as much as I, I don't mean, want like, that to happen, it's so good writing. <laughs> it is. It is good writing. And also like there's no way out of this fight like unless somebody shows up right in here and right now to stop blackbeard like they can't get away law can't teleport because van auger would follow him the crew can't go underwater because blackbeard has been shown to be able to crack the water yeah. like they there's no way out of this fight and even though things were looking good in this latest chapter we ended off on a bad note for Law's crew. The minute Blackbeard starts using the Yami Yami no Mi, it's like, it, it's game over. Th that is how it's always been turned. In the very beginning, Whitebeard was overpowering Blackbeard. Ace was overpowering Blackbeard as well. Magellan, you know, poisoned Blackbeard. <laughs> And then round two is where Blackbeard finally shines. And that's what's happening. So Absol it's, yeah, it's yeah. not looking good. This is like, yeah, because Blackbeard is kind of like the anti-MC. So yeah. he's not going to have like the dominating fights. He's going to get messed yeah. up like the MC, but then ultimately come back. Yeah. yeah, this is all kind of playing out like that, isn't it? All right. So we actually got some new One Piece content in the form of Road to Laugh Tale Volume 1. Now, if you're like hardcore into One Piece, you pretty much know most of this stuff. But there is like three or four things things here that are pretty interesting and one of them is the section on where the final red stone is or the road pone glyph but once you have the information from all four of the road pone glyphs then the location of laugh tail is revealed laugh tail is like the main island of one piece it's where the one piece is like the big macguffin of the series and it shows us on the page where at least we the audience have seen or know where the road pone glyphs are so of course there was one inside of the whale tree tree on Zoe. And then there was another one that was in Big Mom's possession. Both Roger and Brooke were able to get carvings of this despite that. You know, there's also another one that is in Wano somewhere. It actually says on the page that it's confirmed in one of Roger's flashbacks when he kind of just makes a pit stop there to get a carving. Where it says Odin's statement confirmed that Wano was host to one of the coveted stones. Its location remains unknown, but it appears to have been somewhere convenient enough that a rubbing could be made in no time flat. We we also get this little flashback panel of Big Mom talking to Kaido. When in referencing Onigashima, Kaido says, it'll make a nice capital. And Big Mom says, so your road pwn glyph isn't there? And Kaido says, it's too early to be showing your hand, no? And then under that, the text says, Kaido's 
dominion over Wano has seemingly prevented other pirates from mindlessly pursuing this one. So this is interesting because we're like at the end of the Wano arc in the manga right now and we still haven't seen this thing or even know its location. I mean, recently we did see that there is a Pwn Glyph there for sure. It's pretty much the same one that Rook saw a couple chapters back and this was recently revealed actually in chapter 1053 when it's in the same location that Tsukuyaki, aka Hitetsu, had been held captive this whole time. But this was just like a regular information giving Pwn Glyph, not a red one. And since Kaido is MIA at the moment, it's not like he's going to be able to reveal where it is. So something is going to have to happen in these next couple chapters to where this is revealed and uh, they can get a rubbing of it. Because if they do, then I guess they'll have three of the four road Pwn Glyphs. Which means that after they leave Wano, then they could go on to get the last one. And that's actually mentioned here as well, because the last road Pwn Glyph is the one that we saw on Fishman Island back in Roger's flashback from 26 years ago. It was next to Joy Boy's Apology Pwn Glyph, but when the Straw Hats got there, it was gone. And this is like the last one that they would need, if they do in fact get the one that's in Wano. And then under that, it says like, where is the final red stone? It must be somewhere unexplored by the Straw Hat crew. Is the final load Pwn Glyph in a region the Straw Hats have yet to visit? Maybe it's in one of these places. Also guys, if you like my One Piece content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. Thanks. And then there's three places that are like highlighted specifically, and we actually see like panels of them. One is Fulla Lead, which is the Pirate Island. This is like the place where the Rocks crew came together, but also where Blackbeard currently has set up his base of operations. Now, this is like one of the prime candidates, of course, and it, this also could be the reason why Blackbeard is there. I mean, aside from Rocks being there, because, you know, at this point, it's pretty clear that he has some kind of tie to him. But if it's not just that, it could be he's there because you know, the road Poneglyph is there and he's holding on to it just like the other Yonko have. Now, the other location is Elbaf, you know, the homeland of the giants. And it would also make sense if it's there too, because I know a lot of us speculate that this is likely going to be the next arc or at the very least, the next island that the Straw Hats are going to visit. Elbaf is super important to the series. It's heavily implied that Joy Boy was a giant. So his backstory is probably going to be revealed there or somewhat. Also, Prince Loki was set up that needs to be explored. And also, you know, the Adam tree is there, which possibly has a tie to the devil fruits. So why not just have the, you know, road Poneglyph there as well? I mean, that would make sense. And if the Straw Hats do eventually go there, then they can get it and they would be killing like three birds with one stone, right? Now, the last one is the most interesting by far, and it's Vera, the one sunny town now plagued by coups. So if you're like confused as to what this place is, totally understandable because also it's only mentioned like twice in the manga and only like through dialogue we never see it or anything like that so the first time it's talked about is way back in freaking chapter 96 when after nami gets one of the new newspapers she reads like one of the articles and she says the world sure is in turmoil there was another coup d'etat in vera and uh that's kind of where it ends <laughs> and then it's eventually mentioned again in chapter 228 after nami reads one of nolan's journal logs she he says, amazing, a log from 400 years ago. The age of Cayenne, 1120, June 21st. Clear skies, sailed from the lively town of Vera. We'll follow the log pose and sail straight east, northeast. And that's it. Those are the two times that Vera is mentioned in the manga. And then other than that, it's mentioned another two times, but just in like supplementary information. So Oda talks about this in the volume 25 SBS when he's asked, you know, where is Vera? And he says, oh, well, spotted 400 years ago when Nolan visited, Vera is indeed just a merry town. But these days, it's violent and dangerous country in the midst of a coup d'etat. But it's not really so much what's happening in Vera as what's happening all around the world at this time. I think you'll discover what I mean in the near future. Not as large as Alabasta, it's just a small country in the Grand Line. So hold off on your sightseeing trips. So, you know, that's uh, giving us more information on it, I guess. But another little interesting thing here is that it's coming from the volume 25 SBS. Now, granted, he was asked that question at the time, so it's possible that he didn't intend for it to be in volume 25, but volume 25 is important to the latest chapter of One Piece because the cover of that revealed that Buggy and Luffy were going to be the two future Yonko. Then again, Oda does stuff like this all the time, so maybe. 
maybe not. Now, the other time that this is mentioned is in the third One Piece data book called the One Piece Yellow Grand Elements. And it basically says that two years ago, a coup d'etat incited by the revolutionary army occurred in Vera. So that's probably the most insight that we've got into it so far. And considering that, you know, all of this stuff is coming to light now, it's possible that we may have seen Vera for just one panel in chapter 1053. So on the page where Luffy, Kid, and Law's bounties are revealed, right above that, we see like this random place and these people reacting to the news. And it's this place obviously that we haven't seen before and they, you know, kind of look tribal somewhat. And in the background, we see that mural of Sabo. And I'm sure this raised a lot of speculation when we initially saw that. We're like, oh, what is this? Why is Sabo there? We haven't heard about Sabo since his death was implied, or it was implied that maybe he was framed for murdering Cobra or Vivi or something like that. But this place could be Vera because now we know that the Revolutionary Army incited the coup d'etat in Vera. And since Sabo is like the second in command, this could be like a mural like revering him, being like, oh, hey, this guy helped us. Now, the main reason that I'm focusing on Vera is because it's the odd man out here, right? I mean, there are other possibilities listed because it says, there are more possibilities too. The world is vast with many obscure islands. Risky Red Island, Raijin Island, My Storm Island, Balloon Terminal, Yuki Ryu Island, Empty Bluffs Island, Apple Nine Island, etc. But I think he kind of just put there because he didn't want us to focus too much on these three options. But I think these three options are like the main ones. And the odd man out is Vera. And it makes me think that this might be the place where like the last Road Pone Glyph is. And if it is, then that means that it was the Road Pone Glyph that was taken from Fishman Island. And if the revolutionary army is connected to Vera, then it's possible that the revolutionary army is the one that did it. And this could add to Dragon's power, possibly. Now, I know you're also thinking, well, Robin was with the revolutionary army for two years. Why didn't she know about this? Well, it's possible they just didn't tell her. Maybe they didn't go to Vera for her to even see it. Also, you know, there's plot holes connected to that whole storyline anyway, because why didn't Robin ever tell Luffy about Sabo being alive? And why didn't Robin tell everyone? one about what the Pone Glyph and Alabasta said about Pluton. Let's just not worry about that right now. So very interesting, Vera. Obviously, I would have never thought about this because it's, you know, mentioned twice, four times in total. And, uh, you know, maybe this is like Oda's crazy way of rewarding like the super hardcore One Piece fans who are paying that close of attention, maybe. All right, so The Road to the Laugh Tale Volume 3 has been released, and this is giving us like major supplementary information on what is like recently happened in the series and things that we should know going further because you know we're entering the final saga and there's a lot of good stuff here and also like if you're super hardcore into one piece you're probably gonna know all of this but it's also confirming some of the things that we've kind of just been speculating about up until this point so that's always nice especially with a series like this but the main things that it's covering here are like Luffy's Nika fruit and just kind of devil fruits in general and uh, I want to talk about that stuff so first of all with Luffy fruit here it says an 800 year long gap between awakenings when one's mind and body are finally able to harness the true potential of their devil fruit an awakening occurs this particular fruit hadn't been awakened in 800 years but when it was its alternate name became clear so the part about when one's mind and body are finally able to harness the true potential of their devil fruit an awakening occurs I think that's pretty much what Kaido told us actually recently in the manga like towards the end of his fight with Luffy but the whole part part about it hadn't been awakened in 800 years, you know, 800 year long gap between awakenings. I think this is the first time that's being confirmed because before this, in chapter 1037, when the Gorosei are talking about this fruit being awakened, they say it hadn't been awakened for centuries upon centuries. And, you know, you can infer that that means 800, but they never explicitly said that number. So I guess this means that the last person to awaken this fruit was Joy Boy. And since then, it's just been losing. Luffy. And that's understandable because we know that the world government had purposely changed the name of this fruit to the gum gum fruit to make it less appealing. Because it's actually also reminding us here that it was noted that the fruit seemed to be evading the world government on its own accord. The alternate gum gum fruit name 
was probably devised to keep its continued existence low profile. This is because apparently Zoan fruits have a will of their own, so that like aided in it being able to evade them. And there's also another part here about the Zoans having a will of their own, which I'll go into in a little bit. Hey, also guys, if you like my One Piece content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. Thanks. So, you know, if they didn't change the name and it was still known as the mythical Zoan sun god Nika fruit, then it would be uh, way more appealing for people to get. Because the mythical Zoan fruits are pretty much the best fruits in the series. And there's actually a, a section on them here where it says manifesting the mythical powers of legendary animals, even among devil fruits. These are extremely rare, which is definitely true because uh, we haven't really seen many of them, but you really get more of a sense for it when you actually see them like listed here but going further it also says the majority of them seem to possess unique abilities akin to paramecias on top of the standard zoan transformation and yes that's very true i mean for example just look at kaido and luffy's fruit kaido can transform into this big massive dragon but also fire like lightning and fire and wind and stuff it's like three devil fruits in one same thing with luffy's he gets the zoan transformation of becoming whatever Nika is, but then also he gets the Paramecia Awaken abilities of changing things into rubber. And also that aspect of the fruit is touched on here as well, where it says the bizarre ability to rubberize one's surroundings can even make lightning grabbable. And that's pretty awesome. And when like that chapter was released and we were going over that sequence, I don't know why, but I didn't even think that that was happening at the time. I didn't even think like, oh, he just made the lightning rubber. And to be honest i don't even know what i was thinking at that time i guess i just thought oh luffy can just do whatever he wants because you know we were also getting the exposition about he has the ability to turn imagination into reality and that caused a lot of discussion because you know we were kind of comparing it to like the mask and it was like oh can he just literally do whatever he wants but i guess it's not really so much that but just the way that he can manipulate his abilities both on like the paramecia aspect of them as well as the zone makes it seem as though he can quite literally turn his imagination into reality. But to be honest, I think that's so cool, like just rubberizing lightning and then just grabbing it and using it, you know, kind of like Zeus in the new Love and Thunder movie. And uh, yeah, that is pretty ridiculous as it has been described. And I always thought that the mythical Zoan fruits were kind of just Oda's way of saying like, screw it. Because for the most part, the devil fruit power system makes a lot of sense, especially with the rules and poses on them. They kind of just work linearly. Like they have just one ability and then that ability can be, you know, stretched and used in variable ways, but it never really goes outside of the realm of what that inherent ability is capable of. But with the Mythical Zoans, it's not the case. They're almost like Nen abilities from Hunter Hunter or like even curse techniques from Jujutsu Kaisen. So that goes back to me thinking that like Oda kind of just stopped caring with these fruits because he just wanted to make these outrageous abilities and not really care care too much about the base rules that he put on the fruits in the first place. But going further, it says Zoan Awakening. Zoan type awakenings don't affect their surroundings. Instead, the user seems to develop a striking new transformation. And then we see the Jailer Beast from Impel Down, where it says a user's body typically gets much tougher, but their personalities become a little duller. Now that was the case with the Jailer Beasts, but Luffy's personality obviously became more extrapolated, if anything. And also we're getting another panel from that Jailer B sequence from Impel Down with Crocodile saying, they all have devil fruit powers. They're awakened Zoan types. The greatest strength are their toughness and recovery speed. And I'm just glad that this is, you know, being confirmed that this was hinting at that for the longest time, because this was like one of the key sources of information that we pulled from during the weeks of the chapters that Luffy's awakening was being released. And we were using that to pretty much makes sense of why Luffy's awakening happened when it did. Like after he was knocked by Kaido, you know, after getting distracted by the CP0 agent, that's when he suddenly was able to awaken his fruit. But also that brings us to the part about the Zoan fruits having a will of their own. It says in recent years, this trait has allowed for the development of technology that feeds, in quotations, 
zoans to inanimate objects. So as we know at this point, Vegapunk somehow developed the ability for inanimate objects to eat devil fruits. And when we first discovered that this was even a thing, like way back in Alabasta, when that baseball gun thing became a dog or whatever, Usopp was like, that's ridiculous. Even if it was originally a gun, why is it moving? Devil fruits don't have minds of their own. And uh, turns out that they do. And that's the core principle of how this is even able to happen, which of course means that this isn't reliant on Vegapunk doing it. He kind of just discovered that this was a thing and then he was just able to replicate that. I mean, as we saw in Wano, that teapot became a Tanuki or whatever. So as for how this happens, it's still unknown. Maybe like the soul that is within the devil fruit or whatever, like just leaves it and then just possesses the object or whatever, maybe. And then maybe that's how Vegapunk does it. He like is able to extract the spirit or the soul of the fruit and then just put it into the object, maybe. Also, there's some speculation about this whole aspect having a bigger part to the story. Like it's possible that like Zunisha himself is the result of this phenomenon. Like the island of Zoe, like ate a elephant fruit or something and it became Zunisha. So like the island itself is kind of sentient at this. Not confirmed obviously, but it's just, you know, a theory. Also, a lot of people seem to think that Pluton has the same thing going on here. Like it was a ship that ate a fruit. So now it's become even more powerful as a result or something like that. All right. So we got some crazy information revealed about Shanks and surprisingly it's coming from like this companion piece, little volume thing that comes with the purchase of the film red movie i think maybe and it's called one piece volume four billion and this is actually written by oda so it's canonically accurate and like i said i'm just surprised that this substantial information is being revealed in this thing and not like the actual manga but i guess we'll just take what we can get at this point shanks was found by roger and Rayleigh when he was only one year old he was stuffed into a treasure chest that was stolen by roger during the god valley incident so that's it it's finally being revealed here in this little volume thing of all places. This is something that we've been speculating about for years. I actually made a video about this going into detail. You can watch it here if you're interested, but it's just nice to finally get the confirmation here that Shanks was indeed found by Roger at God Valley. And we were able to figure this out by kind of just matching up dates for the most part. One of the other aspects, of course, is Shanks's rapport with the Gorosei. Hey, also guys, if you like my One Piece content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. And since we know that the God Valley incident revolved around Roger and Garp teaming up to basically like defend the Celestial Dragons against rocks, we assume that, oh, well, if you put all this together, it probably means that Shanks is a Celestial Dragon. But Film Red actually might give us a little more information as to why Shanks could be a Celestial Dragon. Because from the official novel of it, Yuta is said to have the blood lineage of the Figureland family. Shanks is considered her father, so it can safely be said that the five elders, the Gorosei, think both Shanks and Yuta belong to Figureland. They ask, do we have to kill her even though she is Figureland related? So. I'm not really sure what this entirely means, of course, but it seems like Figureland might be the Celestial Dragon family that Shanks came from, possibly. And considering what the Gorosei is saying here, so at least in my opinion, this is all but confirming that Shanks is a Celestial Dragon. And this is gonna be so satisfying once it's fully revealed. I mean, I doubt Luffy will really care, but I also think this is going to reveal why Shanks and Blackbeard just ultimately hate each other since, you know, the get-go. Because, you know, Blackbeard D has something to do with rocks for sure, whether he's like his literal son, which I think is very likely as well, but at the minimum, he's inherited his will. But, you know, D is the natural enemy of the Celestial Dragons, so it makes sense. And I think that Blackbeard might use that as some kind of leverage against Luffy, possibly, or just a justification as to what he may or may not ultimately do to Shanks. I mean, we could just speculate about it forever, but this is just all super super fascinating stuff and it's just nice to finally get some confirmation here at least on the god valley stuff obviously he's not confirmed to be a celestial 
Dragon yet, but I think it's inevitably coming. Hey, but real quick, guys, I just want to talk about Gamer Sups for a second because I'm a big fan of this stuff. They actually just dropped a new flavor called Kaho's Guilty Pleasure, which is basically just a green tea flavor. And it's also in collaboration with Kaho Shibuya, but I've also been drinking peach tea and strawberry lemonade. And this stuff just makes working so much easier. Like I've been drinking this stuff instead of coffee and I just love it so much. So if you're interested in getting some gamer subs of your own, check out the link in the description or just use code big Z on the gamer subs website. Thanks guys. Shanks is bounty 12 years ago in the first chapter of one piece was 1 billion, 4 million berries. So that's nice confirmation too. I mean, we assumed that Shanks was incredibly powerful in the first chapter as well. Even if uh, he did lose his arm to the sea king, things were different then. And I think I read somewhere that Oda was kind of pressured by his editors or something into having Shanks losing an arm so that the stakes would be raised or something. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's true. But regardless, you know, obviously the entire story wasn't fully fleshed out at that point, especially not, uh, you know, scoping out the entire nuanced power system over 10 years in advance. Shanks is known as the killer of observation hockey. He can kill or control one's own breath, and he doesn't let his opponent see future sights. So that's pretty amazing right there. I don't know if this literally means he can like make you suffocate just via his hockey power, but I think that would make sense if he could, because if you can just knock somebody out with it, I guess you could control other aspects of them too. If you have such a masterful control over it, such as Shanks is implied to have here, the fact that he could just shut down Future Sight is pretty amazing too, because you know, obviously Future Sight is a big aspect of fighting at the highest level in One Piece. And if you just have the ability to shut that down, you have such a substantial advantage over your opponent. And I just think this is so cool. Like how advanced and nuanced, like the application and control of Conqueror's hockey can become, or just hockey in general. And it's also possible that Shanks became this adept at using hockey because he doesn't have a devil fruit and he doesn't have to necessarily worry about working on that power or how it may or may not conflict with whatever else he's doing. He could just 100% focus on hockey and its application and he just becomes like this virtuoso with it. Shanks' conqueror hockey is very powerful. <laughs> Shanks uses his fiery or burning sword against his enemies. So yeah, we knew this of course, but his fiery or burning sword, maybe we necessarily didn't. And I've talked about this in many videos, but when we see Shanks fight in the video games, he kind of just uses like the conqueror hockey lightning as like a tangible attack. It's kind of like the main foundation of his fighting style and I think this could be hinting towards that or he just literally ignites his sword on fire kind of like how King does you know although we know that he's a Lunarian or it could be something similar to Sanji although it's kind of implied that it has something to do with what either Judge did or that thing that his mom drank or a combination of the both or I don't know it'll be revealed eventually Oda says that Shanks has his own plans for the new era okay so that's kind of big especially because we hardly know what Shanks's motives are. He's super secretive and mysterious. And just the fact that he has his own plans for the new era means that he, you know, does want to get the One Piece, of course, as it was revealed recently in the manga. And I think this could be a good way for him to be like a big antagonist to Luffy. I mean, yeah, at this point, they're pretty much friends. But, you know, Luffy did say that he would defeat Shanks on Punk Hazard. And I'm pretty sure Shanks isn't going to just let Luffy have the one piece or become the pirate king like shanks probably wants it for himself i assume and this uh, more or less kind of confirms that and i think that is going to be like a nice way for them to have conflict i don't know like if they ultimately wind up meeting on laptail or whatever Shanks would be like, Luffy, I have my own plan and it's the right way. And this is the way that things should be. So you're just going to have to accept it or I'm going to have to defeat you. You know, something like that. And also the eventual reveal of him possibly being a celestial dragon may play into that. Okay, so in the previous chapter, we saw that Luffy had obviously met up with uh, Rob Lucci and they transformed and they fought and all that stuff. But before that happened... We kind of cut away to Aki Inu back at uh, Naval Headquarters. <laughs> and he found out that the Straw Hats were on Egghead, but things are different now because he's a Yonko. And he says it's basically like a declaration of war at this point. Uh, and he doesn't want, you know, CP0 to battle them. And he's asking like, all right, so where's, you know, Kizaru? And then somebody says like, he's already on his way to Egghead for a prior <laughs> operation, which is interesting. 
Uh, and then he's like, then Akinu says, then tell Lucci to wait for the Navy to arrive. Do not let him battle with Straw Hat, uh, referring to uh, Lucci. So that brings us to like the topic of this video. Kizaru is for sure going to show up in Egghead in, in this arc. Oh like, yeah, he, we're 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 past the point of where he's asking. He's just already there. Apparently, he had a prior operation, which is interesting. Um. But now he's going to show up, and I assume he's going to show up in time to face off against Luffy, right? Do you think that's likely here? I I think that's a safe assumption that he would show up very soon because he has the Glen Glen fruit, right? Like, he can travel at the speed of light. There should be no reason why he almost isn't in this chapter that we got just uh, recently. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if they're like, hey, uh, you know, Kizaru, he just left. And then by the end of the chapter, he shows up and he's like, all right, I made it on time. Like, I think that would have been really cool. It would have given that, like, that that light, light fruit effect. But, yeah, he's going to show up, and he's going to cause a lot of turmoil. I don't know what's going to happen exactly, but if he were to fight Luffy, I, I just don't think we're at the point of the story where we would simply lose to an admiral. If it was, like, one-on-one, -on -one, right? Like, if, if, Kizaru and Luf in, if Kizaru and Luchi were teaming up against Luffy, that's a different story. Oh, that that's something. Yeah, I guess that is very likely something to happen too. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um almost almost a little overkill at this point maybe. Um But it's like, okay. So you think that we're got to the point in the story where Luffy shouldn't be losing to an admiral? Yes. I, I mean, with his newfound Yonko title with him taking down Kaido in Gear 5th and all the room he can grow with it. I just feel like it's it's too where we're too late in the game to lose. Uh, if we lose, if Luffy loses, it's, it's going to have to be to something ridiculous, just something we haven't seen before. And there's so many built, there's so many things about Kizaru's character that I just feel like don't work well for him during this fight. Like we we're talking about the gloves that um, we were introduced to earlier in this arc, the light touching gloves, and people were like, oh, like, maybe somebody's gonna use that to attack Kizaru, but, you know, the, the more I think about it, the more it kind of also doesn't make sense, right? Because I would imagine Gear 5th, Hockey, and Ryo, I feel like that would work better against Kizaru than the light gloves, but, you know, well, we'll have to wait and see what that's all about. And even during Luffy's fight against Kaido, he grabbed a Thunderbolt, right? Yeah. Like, he just grabbed a random Thunderbolt. If Kizaru shoots a light beam, who's to say Luffy just can't grab that and, like, throw it right back at him? Like, there's a lot of nuances with Kizaru's fruit that I just feel like won't work well for him in this specific fight. That's exactly what I thought of, too. Um, I thought of the, the, the lightning grab, which is amazing. Like, when I first read that chapter, like, I don't know my brain wasn't like processing that he like turned the lightning to rubber and then grabbed it. I was thinking it was just something that he could just do because, you know, there was a lot of like, I don't know, kind of unknowns that first week or those first two weeks when it was uh, revealed. Yeah. And then in the road to laugh tale, I think volume three, it said that like, yeah, he rubberized lightning. I was like, wow. he did. <laughs> All right, cool. That so is I science, guess, man. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he could do that <laughs> to Kizaru's as well, uh, which I think we'll probably see. Right. Um, him just rubberizing his light ability and then just, I don't I know, mean, doing whatever. Yeah. I don't know if the light ability would necessarily hurt him back. I mean, I guess if it's rubberized light, I guess it could. Like, I mean, I'm not trying to put logic behind One Piece at this point, <laughs> but if he were to grab Kizaru's light beam or even light sword, right? Because we saw him use that against Rayleigh. Like, he could probably just grab the sword and just, like, yank it out of his hands or something. <sighs> That seems like just something likely. super cartoony. Uh, and also you brought up the gloves. Like, I do think the gloves are going to be used here. And it's not a coincidence that they obviously link up with grabbing light and then Kizaru coming here. Maybe it's not for Luffy. Maybe it's like for the other Straw Hats. Because, you know, you said that everybody else has hockey and whatnot. And that solves yeah. the light Logia problem. But for the other Straw Hats, who for some reason at this point in the story still don't have freaking hockey... <laughs> Yeah, I'm so shocked. <laughs> Honestly, by the time we hit time skip, I thought that Frankie, Robin, like, I thought more Straw Hats would have hockey, or at least show, like, slight glimpses of Arnimate even. But that's not really the case. But, you know, they all make up for it with their Devil Fruits or their quirky abilities, so it, it's kind of fine. But when I think of the light gloves, like, you're right, like, Luffy probably wouldn't use them. Zoro has swords, so he wouldn't punch Kizaru. We have Sanji who doesn't hit with his fists. We have Jinbei who knows Fishman Karate and full body ornament based on the anime. 
So it's like, dang, like, I, I guess Robin could, but if Robin puts them on, like, does it work with their devil fruit? I don't think so, because it's just, yeah, like, exactly. bare naked hands. Uh, Frankie yeah. is a cyborg, so he has a giant arm, so that really wouldn't work either. Like, and then there's Usopp, and I'm like, I, I can't see Usopp boxing Kizaru, so that's <laughs> that's just, like, a, a crazy fanfic right there. So it's like, who would use it? And And then there's Brooke, who also has a sword. Like, I feel like the gloves just wouldn't fit any of the straw hats necessarily. Yeah, oh, unless Vegapunk just does it himself or something. Um, but <laughs> Time to take things to... in my own hands, yeah. Exactly. They have to come back into play somehow. But um, just as for Kizaru versus Gear 5 Luffy, you just think that naturally, since Luffy defeated Kaido, he should be able to defeat kizaru as well right yeah i mean um i'm not afraid to say it like yeah i think luffy would definitely take on kizaru i know like a lot of people are scared of power scaling and uh, I'm, I'm totally fine like opinions change right if we get the next chapter and luffy is down for the count then obviously my opinion is going to be very different but as of right now and based off of what i've seen personally i think that luffy would beat kizaru would it be an easy fight no like i don't think this would be an easy fight at all and another thing that Oda has been hiding from the audience is Logia Awakenings. We haven't seen a single one in the story. We've seen multiple Paramecia, multiple Zoan Awakenings, not a singular Logia Awakening. So if anybody were to have it, it would, it would have to be one of the admirals, I would assume, right? So yeah, you said that we haven't seen it, which is technically true. But yes. uh, Aki Inu and uh, Kuzan... They yeah, um, are implied to be, yeah, they're implied to be awakened. Um, yeah, because they, in theory, made Punk Hazard that way by using yeah. their awakening abilities and changing it. So if they are hypothetically awakened, then I guess Kizaru would have to be as well. Um, I, but that being I said, would about, agree. Yeah, about the, but about the uh, Logia awakenings, I don't, I think the only thing that we really get like super special with these awakenings seems to be Zoan. Because like, you know, the other Paramecia awakenings that we've seen, it's kind of just like, yeah, we have the ability to change things. I guess Logia yeah. is the same thing. And it's just like the Zoans get the special stuff for some reason. Like they get a transformation and new abilities and stuff. But Logia is And then and it, even in this chapter, like Luchi gets like a cloak of black clouds too. Yeah, no, Zoan awakenings are super hype. Exactly. And so if Unless uh, Oda just decides to include some kind of new thing. Because he always could. I mean, why not? Just like, ah, Loki yeah. uh, Awakenings can do this and do that. And it's like, okay, why not? You know, makes things more interesting at this point in the story. But at this point, it just doesn't seem like they're doing too many, like, special things. So, yeah, it goes back to, I think Luffy should be able to defeat him in a 1v1. Yeah. Uh, like you said, not easy, of course. And you were talking about the power scaling thing, and it's like, yeah, I'm hesitant to do it too because, man, you know, people treat it like religion and politics and stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which side are you on? Exactly. There's only one right answer here, and it's the one that I want. Uh, yeah. Or whoever's writing the comment, but like, I, you can't. It's difficult to even power scale it because, like, Kizaru hasn't done that much. Luffy's only went against Kaido and uh, Luchi, so. You know, it, that's why it also gets really intense because there's not enough information to give you like a definitive answer other than just assuming that Gear 5 Luffy should be stronger than Kizaru at this point. If you were talking about like him against Aki Inu, that would be difficult for me to really think about who would win that because I hold Aki Inu at such a higher um, level of power. I regard, yeah. Not like way higher, but I think he's, you know. Strong enough he, to where admiral. you don't know who's going to win between him and Luffy. As we're Kizaru, I think we kind of know that Luffy should be able to take it. But um, this will probably be a tougher fight for him than what Luchi represents for sure, right? I would say so. Um, I mean, Luchi's in the realm of Gear 5th at this point, right? Like, whether or not Luffy needs it to beat him, he's he's keeping up at least to this regard, right? Like, they, they exchanged a couple blows. Luchi's right there with him. And I know a lot of people hate to see that Luchi is that strong, but I really just think we need to wait for that next chapter. Like, dude, anything can happen. It's a shonen manga. It's One Piece. Oda loves the parallels. He loves Luchi. 
So if we get to the next chapter and Luchi's actually giving Luffy a run for his money, then, you know, opinions can definitely change. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm right there with you. All right, so since we got the reveal in Chapter 1069 that Luchi had awakened his leopard fruit, a big question in the community that we've had since then is like, wait, was Kaido awakened? Because that was something that we were like questioning throughout most of his like final round of fight with uh, Luffy, especially after Luffy awakened his fruit and it was made apparent. Oh, yeah. And now that we have this dialogue box straight up telling us that, like, this is an awakened form for Luchi, we never got that with Kaido. Um, so it's like, before I go into, with you know, all of the evidence to support that Kaido is, but also evidence to support that he's not, which I'm sure you've seen most of it. Oh, yeah. What Do you think that Kaido was awakened? No. <laughs> I, I, I do not think he's awakened. So... Here's the thing. Uh, there, there's two main arguments that people use to say that Kaido is awakened. Uh, the first one is that he has the fish fish fruit model Seryu and that he started as a fish and then became a dragon. That is complete heresy. Uh, if that was true, then Momo is also awakened, which can't be the case <laughs> since we saw him eat the fruit and immediately turn into a dragon. The fish fish model is just a classification. Seryu as a dragon, it's a water dragon. And that's why it has the fish fish connotation. As far as the next argument that I've seen people say is that he, or at least Oda, doesn't have to explicitly say when users are awakened. They're like, oh, can't you appreciate the nuance? Like, Oda is just making him awake and he doesn't have to say it. Why, why would he say it? But here's the thing. Every single awakened user in the series has been stated to be awakened. Doflamingo, Katakuri, the, the Impel Down Jailers, Luffy, Luchi. Everyone who is awakened in One Piece, Oda has explicitly said they are awakened. So if Kaido was awakened, I feel like he wouldn't be the the one exception out of like 10 different characters. That all of a sudden they just wouldn't say it. The, the best thing that people can say for Kaido being awakened, in my opinion, would be the change in his teeth. Uh, so his hybrid form, he had like very square, you know, jagged looking or square looking teeth. And then eventually when he starts getting drunk, they turn more and more sharp. But I mean, at the same time, that's kind of just like aspects of a dragon. So I don't even know if I'd consider that like a awakening. And then with this chapter, we see that Luchi has this black cloud around him. So like maybe the cloud is what symbolizes an awakened Zoan user. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards since Luffy also has that as well. But we don't just, we just know, don't know for sure. But I feel like there's more evidence to Kaido not being awakened than being awakened yeah i mean it does seem that way more evidence to support that he's not awakened especially since he didn't get the dialogue box um and yeah when you say that he does change uh aesthetic while in hybrid form he does i mean he yeah he has like the more humanoid teeth with the fangs and then it eventually just becomes like all fangs and his nose changes and his eyebrows change his eyebrows actually take on the aesthetic of like the cloud stuff that we see from Luchi, uh, Luchi and uh, Luffy. Yeah. But that's still not enough. Although it is interesting that Oda chose to do that, how they're just so different. And he does seem to be bigger uh, in a stature wise, kind of like how the impelled down uh, jailers were. And that's another thing that always kind of bothered me about it. It's like if the impelled down guys <laughs> were awakened, then why the hell isn't kaido i mean at the same time though the impel down jailers they were really goofy like they had no mind of their own they were just kind of bumbling around fighting people like exactly. i'd almost say like they're incomplete awakenings right kind of okay. like a false super saiyan i'm glad you brought that up because i think that's a thing here uh because in chapter 1069 right before uh luchi's panel uh, for his awakenings revealed shaka says that it's usually the case that awakened Zoan powers absorb and control the user's personality. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly that's what happened with the impelled down uh, jailers. But it's like, did that necessarily happen with Kaido? And uh, if you're going back to like the, you know, incomplete awakening or partial awakening, uh, Kaido also says, you know, to Luffy... Awakening is what happens when the user's mind and body catches up. 
Um, so the thing with Kaido is that I guess you could argue that Kaido still being a classic drunk is showing that his personality is shining through the awakening. But, I mean, even with Luffy, like, his awakening kind of takes over his mind, doesn't it? Like, he just starts laughing all the time. Like, it, it's almost yeah. like an uncontrollable laughter. Like, he just ate a smile fruit or something. Like, yeah, yeah. Luffy in Gear 5th form isn't, like... I mean, he is Luffy, but he's, like, a funnier Luffy. Yeah, so, that's... Yeah, that, Ka I think that's... Kaido hasn't shown any signs of that. No, he hasn't. And that's, I think, what Oda was trying to get across to us in one of those first chapters after Luffy awaken because people are like oh is he nika now is he a different person yeah and it was like no i'm still luffy i'm just goofy now and i'm weird <laughs> <laughs> and it's like okay um so i mean i don't want to go too deep into that stuff because you, sometimes like we the hardcore fandom like build this whole other lore and we accept oh, yeah. it as canon and then it turns out that oda didn't want that wasn't even thinking about it, or just mangas in general but it is possible that there is like this true awakening, semi-awakening thing. I, I guess there kind of has to be, right? Unless all the awakenings of the devil fruits aren't created equal and they all don't get these flame things around them. Because also Yamato had that. Yeah. And it's like, is she awakened? That's, a, that's an interesting one because Yamato wasn't ever explicitly said either. And we never thought that Yamato was awakened. I don't think there was really anybody that was arguing that Yamato was awakened until just recently with this chapter. Yeah, exactly. So now now it brings back Yamato into play. And the thing with Yamato's fruit is like, we don't really know what her fruit is supposed to look like in real life. We don't have any references, right? Like we can't just like open a picture book and say, ah, oh, yes, this is when my grandpa saw this creature <laughs> in the woods. And it looks just like Yamato. Like we don't know if this Zoan form of hers always had clouds or only had clouds because she awakened like how does a good example too because he has clouds but those are the flame clouds around his arms and legs and momo has those too so yeah i don't know if those would count yeah and i also said it before that this is possibly just a design that oda likes to use and yeah. it doesn't necessarily indicate an awakening I don't Looking know. deep it, into it. Yeah, I mean, maybe it, it. I would believe both. I would believe that it does, but also yeah. that he was just like, "Oh, I just like this design. It doesn't really mean much." Um, because it, with Luffy, yeah. it made sense, right? Because it was like the yeah. Sun Wukong type of aesthetic going on. But with everybody else having it, it's like, okay, maybe this is something with the Devil Fruits, especially Luchi. Because, like, yeah. leopards don't have that, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I've, I've been to the zoo once or twice, and oh, okay. uh, the leopards don't have this. <laughs> um, so, Kaido, I, I, it's just, like, I can't say for sure that he is or isn't. Like, it's so difficult to say because he's so powerful. Like, he has room to grow. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of a good thing, right? Like, if he wasn't awakened... It just shows that this man was an actual menace. A Yonko, a Grand Fleet beside him, taking on Gifrith Luffy, oppressing an entire country for years, and the man wasn't even awakened yet. Yeah. Like, it's like Super Saiyan, right? Like, he could just keep on going above and beyond. That's Kaido, essentially. Like, I don't even think it's a diss to say he's not awakened. And no, people are bringing up the fact that he wants to, like, you know, how he wants to constantly off himself. That's kind of like his whole personality. Like, maybe that's the reason why, like... Because Luffy had to die and then get awakened. Maybe Kaido is the same way. Maybe, like, after he gets out of the lava, he's oh. like, oh, look at this. <laughs> look what I can do. He has, like, clouds around him finally. Wow. And then he starts being thankful to Luffy. Like, oh, you finally did it, my man. Somebody yeah. finally beat me and I'm awakened. I mean, it is I mean, that's possible. like a, That's kind of a fanfic to you, though. But. Oh, I mean, most of this is. but Yeah, one it, piece. Of <laughs> yeah, but it's like... Is that why his mind hasn't caught up to his body yet? Because if anything, his body has definitely caught up to the power of the fruit or whatever to be awakened. But oh, yeah. His, his mind didn't. And him acting and behaving the way that he did in the series was maybe indicative of that. And yeah, maybe him getting killed by Luffy is what pushes him. But that means that Kaido's still alive. And yeah. <sighs> I mean, I just feel like it's too early for him to be gone. And I always reference back the fact that Oda, he originally had a concept where Kaido and Yamato would talk at some point. 
about like leaving Wano, but that never happened. And, and that could have just been absolute retconned because that was so long ago. Yeah. But I mean, if Kaido was still alive and, you know, maybe sleeping in a volcano right now, <laughs> I mean, maybe we could get that. Maybe we could get Kaido saying, hey, Yamato, uh, what, what are you going to do after? What are you going to do now that like Wano's like free? I don't know. I, I just don't. I can't imagine that Kaido, even if he were still alive, he would go back to Wano and try to oppress them again. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of like one and done. It's like it's like yeah. Crocodile, right? Like Crocodile tried, he lost. He's not going back to Alabasta killing everybody. <laughs> no. Kind of how it is. It's typical shonen stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but I guess now it makes sense more that we talked about it that he's not awakened. That it's more so just the dialogue box for me. Uh, then he yeah. never got it. But um, do you recall off the top of your head when they were fighting Kaido and he was turning into the different stages of drunk? Didn't he have like a dialogue box at the bottom of uh, each one of those transformations? Yeah, it said like uh, when he got all like loving drunk and it was like beggared form or something. Yeah. Okay. And none of the, none of them said awake. Like if Oda wanted to, he could have just slipped the word, right? Like just put awakened awakening form. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Remember loving drunk. That. Yeah. No, I don't. No, he never got anything like that. More so, just um, beggared form or anything. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's that's really it. It's just he's probably not awakened, but he could be. <laughs> He could be. It wouldn't ruin the story one way or another. No. And this could definitely be something that Oda brings up in an SBS, right? Like some random askers, yeah. like, hey, Oda, was Kaido awakened? And then Oda just says, yeah. And that's it. Like, <laughs> on to the either, next question. Yeah, he's either like, yeah, or he gives you a paragraph of a non answer. Yeah, he's like, well, let me tell you, I once <laughs> ate takoyaki in a street in Nibuya, and uh, uh, I, it reminded me of Kaido. Yeah, and then uh, that's <laughs> what I decided. Random. I love the SBSs. Exactly. 